My name is Cassie and I'm the coordinator for Partners of Scott County Watersheds. And with me today um, is, uh, well, Amy Kay, who is our board chair. Um, she um, may or may not be on today due to technical difficulties, but she helped us with this presentation. And then Steve Gustafson, who is my vice chair. And today we will highlight some of the activities that we've been up to in 2020, as well as share snapshot data from 2020 and go through uh, what our plans are for the future. So um, as a, an introduction, um, here is our mission for those of you that haven't tuned into a forum before. It's to improve the stewardship of Scott County watersheds through education, technical guidance, and volunteer opportunities. We do have a website, partners of Scott County watersheds.org, and you can also find us on Facebook and LinkedIn. So we also have a, a membership and funding partner program to keep these forums going as well as our snapshot water quality monitoring activities and any special workshops that we put on for the public. So if you wanna learn more about the benefits associated with those and where your money goes, you can visit our website. Also, um, after today's forum, we will take the winner off and the next forum will be Tuesday, February 16th from noon to one. Uh, the details will be announced later as far as who the speaker is and if it will be virtually or um, in person. And then we will have our snapshots once again in 2020 or 2021. So with that, I will go ahead and open up my other presentation. Also, if you have any questions for us along the way, please feel free to type them in the chat at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and then we will get to those at the end. So like I said before, we are summarizing our achievements for 2020 and our future plans. So here's our board. I uh, have a lot of uh, different representatives from different communities in Scott County. Um, Amy Kay is the, from the city of Davenport is our board chair. And then Steve Gustafson, who is a Bettendorf resident is our vice chair. And then you can see me over there. I am the coordinator. And then we also have representatives from the city of Eldridge, city of Bettendorf, um, Scott County, um, DNR, um, Eastern Iowa Community Colleges, and um, some other local uh, organizations like Nahant Marsh and Iowa American Water. So um, as a background, um, when we're going into the snapshot data, um, we do have 239 historical sample sites throughout Scott County over the years. And this includes uh, mostly streams and some lakes. Um, it does not include the Mississippi River. Um, although we have 239 historical sample sites over the 20 so or so years that we've been sampling, we don't sample all of these on a consistent basis. Currently with our 2020 snapshot, we monitored 62 out of those 239 sites. We analyze for a lot of different parameters related to water quality. And these all help us determine um, possible uh, sources of pollution, as well as different uh, steps that we can take in order to uh, take those pollution levels down. So for example, nitrate and nitrite, which are um, natural elements that are found in fertilizers, both uh, urban and rural. Ammonia and phosphorus, which are also um, commonly found in fertilizers and other natural occurrences. Uh, chloride, so from uh, salt levels in the water, pH, dissolved oxygen, air and water temperature, transparency, water color. There's a lot of different things that we measure for. And we uh, sometimes can conduct a lab analysis, which uh, concentrates further on nitrate, nitrite, and phosphorus. And this helps validate the readings that our volunteers are giving us, as well as uh, give us uh, more accurate readings as well. So um, thank you to the city of Davenport and the wastewater treatment lab for helping us with those uh, lab costs this year for 2020. Um, also, we have done a little bit of a fecal bacteria lab analysis. This um, uh, tests for E. coli, as well as um, some other specialized tests that can identify what types of um, E. coli bacteria that is present in a water watershed. And then also we've done some other testing in the county um, and we have all of this data going back over 20 years on our website. So we're going to summarize 2020's data, but you can go back um, as far as uh, 2000 to see uh, the results from the other snapshots that we've done. 
So our database contains uh, a lot of information. I won't read all of these, but as you can see, going back to 20 years, we have a lot of information and this helps us determine uh, trends in the different types of parameters that I mentioned before. So that if there is a major change over time, for example, in the amount of nitrogen that's flowing into a stream, we can uh, identify this and uh, possibly do some further investigating to uh, remediate that. For those of you that haven't participated in a snapshot before, we recruit volunteers and there comes from different backgrounds and different ages. And we teach them how to use specialized lab equipment in order to perform simple water quality tests. And a lot of that includes taking a little stick. So as you can see in the third picture, um, that's a nitrogen test. Basically you dip that stick into the water, wait for 30 seconds, and then it changes to a shade of pink and you determine which, uh, level matches that shade of pink. Same with the first picture, dissolved oxygen. That is an ampule that you break off into a sample of water and it changes to a shade of blue and you determine which value matches that shade of blue. We also have things like transparency. So that second picture is a, called a turbidity tube. You can fill that up with water and then there's a black and white symbol on the bottom. If you take that valve and you slowly release the water and you look through the top of the tube until you see that symbol, that measures how clear the water is down to the centimeter. And then um, on the right is an example of one of the bottles uh, for chloride. And those are the different values that you can get off of that. So like I said, um, we have 62 sites that we tested in 2020. We tested three times a year. So we did it once in May, once in July, and once in October. And we our volunteers get uh, paired up or in groups of three or four. And we assign each group about five to seven different sites around the county to test. And so they all meet up at a central location. We give them their assignment as well as all the material that they need. And then we send them out to their assigned sites to get the data. Once they record the data, they bring it back to us. And we have a snapshot in time of uh, what all the streams or water shed sites in Scott County are on that particular day. Um, we had 80 volunteers this year. So we had 20 in the spring, 27 in the summer, and 33 in the fall. Um, things were a little different this year due to COVID restrictions. So we had some lower volunteer numbers than last year um, just because of some last minute changes that had to be made as far as capacity li limits of our meeting places and um, just the comfort level of the volunteers that were helping us out. Also, in the spring, we actually did not have community volunteers helping us. We had municipal staff and some other partners um, that work with partners of Scott County Watersheds to do that sampling because the COVID situation was so new and we weren't sure how we were going to logistically do it with volunteers. Um, but we were able to recover and continue the rest of the year. Also in the summer, we do a macroinvertebrate study. So that is uh, going stomping in the creek and taking a net and uh, scooping out some uh, water and other material from the bottom of a site and then counting the types of bugs that or macroinvertebrates that you see at a site. And this is a great indicator of watershed health because certain species of bugs and other invertebrates can't survive in high levels of pollution. And so if those are not present, then you know that there is an issue with that watershed. So we did 10 sites this year. And then also new this year, we added some lake sites. So historically we've done a lot of streams, but we are, have decided to add these lake sites now that we have enough water quality monitoring materials to do so. And our volunteer, um, our, our, we have a lot of regular volunteers that are returning. And so we have more volunteer manpower. So that includes the Crow Creek Wildlife Management Area near Mount Joy, the Vanderveer Lagoon, the Middle Park Lagoon, Lost Grove Lake, Pride Lake at Scott County Park, and the Crow Creek Park Quarry. And um, we also have done further nitrate, nitrite, and phosphate analysis for those sites this year. So here's a picture of all of the water quality sites that we tested for in 2020. As you can see, they're spread out around the county all the way up to uh, the Dixon area, over to practically Stockton, um, a lot in the QC metro area, as well as up um, closer to the Wapsie River and McCausland. So uh, we have uh, a wide variety of areas that we go to, and this really helps give us a great big picture of Scott County's watershed health. 
The reason that they're different colors is because that's how I group them together for the snapshot water quality events. And now I will turn it over to Steve to cover the data analysis for the 2020 snapshots. Thanks, Cassie. Um, yeah, this is Steve. Thank you everybody for coming. I'm gonna kind of run through these slides and, and then hopefully have time to take some questions if there are any. So the first parameter we'll look for is nitrate. And uh, of the 62 sites, 42 of them had enough data that I could do trends on. Some of them were just too new or they're in the new lake sites. So I, I wasn't comfortable doing any trend analyses on these. Um, for the 2020 year, the data range between zero and 20 milligrams per liter of nitrate. But most of the samples we took were in the two to 10 milliliter per liter uh, range, which is parts per million. I didn't see anything that was unusual, new spikes or anything like that. The numbers are pretty consistent with uh, historical data. Uh, as you can see, I broke down the, the kind of sites if they're rural or urban, and then basically countywide is all the sites. The, what we're looking at is the majority of the sites had an upward trend. That's just basically a simple slope on a graph. You know, if, if it was going up, you got an up. If it was, seemed like it was stable, you know, obviously got a stable and then down is a negative slope is, is down. We, um, in addition to that, that's what we want obviously is a downward trend or at least a, a stable to downward trend, but the concentration also also matters. Um, so for, I looked at 2002 to 2020, uh, the, the average for the county is about three parts per million nitrate. For rural, site, rural sites, it averages about four, and for urban sites, about two parts per million. So obviously the average is three. Um, there is not a water quality standard in Iowa for nitrate besides a drinking water standard of 10 parts per million. And there's only one location in the, in the state county, sorry, that has uh, the average concentration above that drinking water standard. And that is on Sycamore Creek by I-80, uh, where I-80 comes into 67, or uh, yeah, on 67. Let's see, in the urban areas, most sites, the average is between one to four parts per million. The highest is that same site uh, on Sycamore Creek with an average of 12. Lowest is around two and that, or 0.2 and that's in Blackhawk Creek. Um, in the rural areas, the sites average between four and seven parts per million. The highest is around seven. Uh, Cassie, you can go to the next slide. Um, we did some laboratory analyses this year. Like, as he said, we didn't get to do a whole lot of everything we we're going to do. We we're just happy to be able to do some sampling at all. So we did 20 samples that were set in uh, at the same time as we collected the field sample. And as you can see, um, about a third, the field result was a little bit higher and about two thirds of the, the field result was a little bit lower. Average distance difference has been two. So it's, it's, it's not too bad in accuracy. You know, it just gives an idea of how close our field results results are to actual uh, laboratory analyses. Um, that, like I said, there's no standard right now, and I don't see that coming. It's it's very complicated to to put a nitrate standard. It seems like, um, but our our job is to focus on the trends. We want downward trends. You know, as the data kind of shows, rural areas on average a little bit higher concentrations. All sites seem to have, or all areas seem to have a, a, an upward trend. When I look at uh, concerned site creeks, I'm look, Sycamore, Spencer Creek, Hickory, Hickory Creek, and an unnamed street, uh, unnamed creek uh, in Northern Scott County by 305th Street. Those are sites where the trends are up and the concentrations are going up. It seems like. Um, next slide, please, Cassie. Nitrite is a is a, another version of, of nitrogen in the in the system. It's short lived, and we did see some detections this year, but it it's mostly not an issue. And the the, the trends are down stable, so it's 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 not a concern. If it if it's there, we're not sampling enough to to see it. Obviously, because it's short lived. You can go to the next slide. Transparency. Transparency and measure how clear the water is. You know, and in 2020, values ranged from seven centimeters to 60 centimeters, and that's basically reading off that tube that Cassie had shown you earlier. This is opposite. 
we want a higher value. An upward trend is good. That means the water is getting clearer. As you look at the bar graph in front of you, you can see like countywide, you know, 44% of the sites had a stable value. And in the urban area, a pretty good chunk, more than half had a stable value. Um, and in, in rurals, obviously, the, it looks like water quality is clarity is getting a little better there's high there's more sites with an upper trend and then that's kind of what we want you know um an average value for the county wide is 40 centimeters uh in the rural areas it was 37 centimeters in the urban area 43 centimeters so the urban is has a little more stable clarity and also has a little bit better clarity um what you're really looking at is if it gets below 30 consistently means there's a there's a, a turbidity issue with that with that site you can go to the next slide cassie yeah like i said in general 30 below 30 is a concern um spencer creek duck creek donaldson they're hovering around that 30 centimeters on average and either they have a downward or a stable trend um you can see there's more sites that were rural that were near that 30 centimeters than there were urban, which makes more sense. You know, uh, the urban is just that much more pavement, you know, less exposed uh, ground. And the kind of like what we talked about before in for rural in general, the sites are stable increasing, but their averages aren't quite as good as, as the uh, urban and suburban areas. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Cassie. Phosphorus. So the same kind of thing. Only 42 of the sites, of the 62 sites I did trend analyses on. For 2020, the, the data ranged from zero to two parts per million phosphorus, but most of the sites were in the 0 0.1 to 0 0.6 parts per million range. I didn't see any crazy spikes or unusual concentrations. Again, things were pretty consistent. Um, what I'm looking when I see these sites, I see a lot of stability in the county, in the rural and urban areas. The concentrations aren't really going up and they're not really going down per se. They're just kind of staying stable. Now, the issue is concentrations. Um, on, in, on, on average for like the entire county, the average is 0 0.4 parts per million. Uh, for rural sites, it's 0 0.3 parts per million. In urban sites, it's 0 0.5. Part of that higher number for urban is due to that site on Sycamore Creek, which has such a high phosphorus concentration, and it's considered within a city limits that I consider urban. Um, it, it raises that value. Otherwise, is that the, the average for urban would be 0 0.3. Um, again, not a water quality standard, but kind of a, a rule of thumb is anything greater than 0 0.1 parts per million is kind of a, a threshold for that could cause excess uh, vegetation and eutrophication. Um, like I said, and for the urban sites, most sites are in the 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 range. The high average was 2.8, and that's that Sycamore Creek site. So that kind of throws things out. For rural areas, the highest average was 0 0.8 parts per million. Um, go ahead and the next slide, Cassie. We did some laboratory analysis on these as well. You can see the range of lab data, uh, 0.1 to 0.8, basically. And 40%, our field result was higher than the lab analysis, but in 60%, it was uh, a little bit lower. And two of them were actually right on. So the average difference is 0.1. But when you're talking about everything is a, a, to the 10th, it, it can make a difference. Uh, let's see. Those lower concentrations, and if you've done these kind of con con these field tests, you kind of know that uh, it is hard to get an idea when the concentrations are very low. Um, unfortunately, it just isn't a better test than the one we have right now, besides doing a laboratory analysis test, which we try to do as many as we can. But in the meantime, this is the best we can do to get a good picture. Um, Again, I kind of talked about this earlier that the urban suburban was a higher average concentration, but it's kind of skewed because of that one site. But no more, regardless, phosphorus is a is concern is a present and concern in the rural and urban. 
in suburban areas. You know, it's it's ubiquitous across the county. Um, there, I, there's no one in one area I could say it's an actual source. You know, uh, specific concerns: Sycamore Creek, Hickory Creek, and Blackhawk Creek all have where the the trends are not necessarily going the right way; they're going up, and the the concentrations appear to be increasing as well. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Kathy. Dissolved oxygen. We need this to have good habitat. And again, I only use 42% of the site. Um, fairly good range, two to 12 parts per million, but most were in that six to nine range. Uh, we didn't have any unusual spikes. If we did see anything, Cassie went out and double checked it to make sure, and it, it just might have been something not working right. So we, we ended up in everything was okay. I didn't create a bar graph for this, but you know, it, it seems to be broken down in the thirds that uh, in, as far as percentages, you can see there's a difference between two, 2002 to 2020 and then this last year's data. And I think that's partly due because the, we got rid of 12 sites that were too dangerous to send, send people to. So I weren't using that, wasn't using those for the trends anymore. Um, <clears throat> on average, it, DO seems to be about eight. You know, in urban sites, it's a little bit less. You want to have this five to nine range, or five to 10, 11, maybe, you know, range of, uh, of dissolved oxygen. I, I kind of get worried when the trends are down and we get closer to that five on average. And so there's some sites, the concerns are like Candlelight Creek, Blackhawk Creek, and Hanlon Creek. The, some of the sites on that, area on those creeks uh, have concentrations that are trending more toward five on average and the, either either stable or sometimes have a downward trend. So it's, it's something we're watching and, and we maybe we might do something to, to increase the dissolved oxygen in those, in those streams if we can. Uh, go ahead, Cassie. Chloride. Um, so uh, one of the major sources for this, obviously, is road salt, but can also be like septic systems and, and different kinds of fertilizers. So in 2020, the data ranged from 20 parts per million to 195 parts per million. And remember, we're not taking any samples in the, in the winter. Um, most of the time, it was in the 25 to 80 milligrams per liter range, parts per million. Uh, we did have some a couple unusual spikes, but after going out and double checking them, we realized it was just might have been a, a faulty strip. Uh, when you look at the countywide, you know, it's again kind of broken up into thirds where thirds going up, third stable and third down. The rural area, even though it shows that there, oh my gosh, there's a huge increasing trend for chloride, the majority of the sites you know, on average are almost no detect. So it's, it's basically starting from zero and it just maybe slightly detecting something. Uh, that's different than in the urban areas. Um, the urban, you have a pretty good chunk of the sites that have a stable chloride concentration, but yeah, and then the, some of these with the, with the higher trends, you, you can see that at 13% there, <laughs> excuse me. Um, so there are actually water quality standards for uh, chloride in Iowa. An acute standard is 629 parts per million. Chronic is 389. And chronic is something we probably would be looking at more where it's, it's that long-term exposure. Uh, like I said, the, the urban sites mostly are in the 50 to 90 parts per million range. But 14% of the sites we tested have concentrations over 100 parts per million. And this is during the summer that they're, they're high. Uh, rural, most of the sites are between 25 and 40 parts per million. So way, way below the, the water quality standards. Um, the sites that I have concerns with are Greenway Creek, on average 170 parts per million. Stafford Creek is a hunt on average 175. Candlelight Creek on average 171. Hanlon Creek on average 130 and Pheasant Creek, 121 parts per million on average. High averages, increasing trends. They're not reaching the standard anytime soon, but they're heading that way. And so I, I wanna look at it more as, do I really think it's residual 
uh, road salt runoff or is there something else going on? It's something that I uh, need to talk about uh, more, but maybe it'll become a problem in rural areas. I don't know, but so far it doesn't seem to be. It's just, just a slight uptick in concentrations makes the trends go up on that one. Uh, next slide, please. pH is not really a concern. We For habitat, you want between a four and nine on the pH scale, and most of the sites are seven to nine. And the average is eight for all, all different kinds for rural and urban and suburban is right in between seven and nine. So I didn't see any spikes and didn't see anything inconsistent with the past. So it's just something we, we watch and it's a good indicator of, a uh, uh, of something going on off with the city, with a, with a stream, but I didn't see anything that concerning this year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Cassie, I believe you're going to talk about this one. Yes. So um, like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, in the summertime, we add a special parameter to our snapshot uh, volunteer events. And this is for macroinvertebrates. And macroinvertebrates are little bugs and other small animals that live within a watershed. And they are a good indicator of watershed health because some are more pollution tolerant than others. So what we can do is we can take a sample of um, a stream and look through the muck that is at the bottom and there'll be all kinds of critters living in there. And what we do is we send out a macroinvertebrate um, expert with a couple of volunteers and they will go through and um, sift through this material and identify the different types of animals that are found in this stream. And what they'll do is they will identify what kind they are as well as how many they have found in a given area and this is um, a math problem that they can uh, do that is called the index of biotic integrity. And it's a number that's calculated to measure the number of unique species in a watershed to determine the diversity of life within a watershed. So a higher IBI equals more species diversity, which in turn equals a healthier watershed, because that means that watershed is hosting species that are pollution tolerant, somewhat pollution tolerant, and pollution intolerant. If you only see pollution tolerant animals in that watershed, that means that the pollution intolerant were not able to survive. So um, a summary you can see on the bottom. So um, an IBI of less than one indicates boar, poor uh, macroinvertebrate populations. So that could possibly indicate poor water quality. An IBI from 1.01 to two indicates fair, which means that some pollution intolerant species might be living, but not the really sensitive ones. And an IBI from 2.01 to 3 indicates good at macroinvertebrate populations because there's a good mix of pollution intolerant, middle, and pollution tolerant species. So also the picture on the right is just an example of a very common invertebrate that we see um, called a damselfly nymph. So here's a summary of what um, the summer snapshot got us as far as macroinvertebrates for the different creeks that we tested. Like I said, we tested 10 different sites and we tried to spread them out all over the county. And uh, those are the IBIs that we calculated for these areas. So the interpretation you can see on the right, Whiskey Run Creek in Princeton had fair, to, uh, had fair populations. Hanlon Creek was fair to good. Stafford and Bettendorf was good. Uh, there is an unnamed creek at Scott Community College that we tested that also is good. Duck Creek in Devil's Glen Park was good. Uh, the East Branch of Mud Creek on the main road in Donahue was fair to good. Duck Creek at Eastern Avenue Park was fair to good. Duck Creek at 90th Avenue in rural Davenport was good. Um, on Highway 22 in Buffalo was fair to good. And Mud Creek uh, at the new Prairie Park in Walcott was fair to good. So overall, um, Trends have not changed too much since last year when we had our first macroinvertebrate survey. So more data is needed um, in, pre in future years in order for us to really determine if a, a creek has uh, declined in macroinvertebrate uh, diversity or increased. So um, for the time being, it, um, this is uh, pretty uh, good news so that we don't have any that are um, showing signs that they are in distress at this time. So Steve, do you want to wrap up the snapshot data? Sure. So I, it, this is kind of a repeat from last year. And 
you know, nutrients are a concern in all three kind of landscapes that we have in the county. Um, and it's not just the stereotypical rural to urban, you know, I, and I don't think you can say there's a definite source that's that's uh, causing it from one to the other, you know, but it, it's probably within each each landscape itself. Um, in general, we would like to see more downtrends for nutrient concentration. You know, uh, chlorides, you know, obviously pretty much urban and suburban concern. No, ex no water quality exceedances just yet, but there are things that I would like to look at more about why we're seeing such high concentrations, <clears throat> not during the winter. Um, the dissolved oxygen I talked about is okay. There's some, some streams that we need to check on just to make sure things are okay. Um, transparency, same kind of thing. There, there's, there's some areas that's not desirable, but you know, that that's, it's, a, it's more of a symptom. You, it's hard to, you'll, you'll be fixing other things with you. If you try to focus on transparency, you'd be fixing other things. You'd be fixing, you know, runoff or stream bank erosion at the same time. pH is not a concern. Uh, we were not able to get any herbicide pesticide analyses done this year. We did get some funding to do that, but the timing just didn't work out. And it just with, with COVID, it was just too much of a stretch, but last year's data, uh, like I said, was promising. There was some detections, but not widespread. But I think we'll we'll try to focus on it more next year. A different, more hopefully, have more funding and and be able to time, do different timing when we sample and get a better idea of what's going on there. So it's I can't say for sure what if it's a problem or not a problem at this point. Um, one interesting thing to note is majority of the streams in our county originate in our county. They're not coming through from another place. So we can't really say, oh, it's Jackson County or, or Clinton County or Muscatine that's causing the problem, you know. Um, we did, <clears throat> Cassie alluded to this before, we did a fecal DNA testing over the past few years. We were not able to do that this year because it's pretty expensive and it can tell you exactly what kind of fecal matter is present, you know, either it's a human or a canine or bird or, you know, and basically I found from this is last year's data that human is a source in rural and urban streams. Dog is more of a urban suburban uh, source as well. And there were some detections of cattle swine in, in rural areas, but it wasn't widespread. But again, that's going to be more data is going to help clarify that. But uh, it, it's very helpful. It's just very expensive. So again, again, for at least for Scott County, Yep, we have water quality issues. We we have too many trends that are not going the right way. It's probably typical for our kind of landform. Um, we'd always be look like that. Look at that more, you know, get an idea. But unfortunately, there's just not a lot of other data in other counties to compare to. Um, like we have a pretty long going, robust database, but not all counties do, and and the the state only state doesn't do quite to the level in each county like we do. They do spot spot sampling um i'd say right now the biggest concerns are, are nutrients and the fecal bacteria impairments that we have and we just keep on uh the nutrients we can analyze those pretty easily the fecal bacteria is, is more difficult to do anything beyond the e coli which is an okay uh parameter test but it doesn't give you a whole lot of data beyond that like the fecal dna uh testing does and I believe that's all I have, Cassie. And the next, yeah, the next slide is our, moves into our, what we accomplished this year. All right, thanks, Steve. And once again, if you have any questions about the snapshot, feel free to uh, type them out in the chat at the bottom of your screen, or you can reach out to us later and we'll be happy to answer those questions for you. All right, so we've got a few minutes left. I want to talk a little bit about what we've been able to accomplish this year, despite uh, COVID kind of you know, changing a lot of plans like everything else in the world. Um, one major thing that we were able to accomplish this year, um, thanks to some grant money from IO American Water and some in-kind uh, and monetary funds from City of Davenport, was to install a special type of filter in Robin Creek in Northwest Davenport. So it's by the um, Marquette Dog Park. Um, and uh, Robin Creek uh, was going to go undergo some renovations. And uh, while we, uh, they were doing some stream bank stabilization, we thought that we could um, use this as a testing site for our biofilters. 
So uh, this type of biofilter was designed by uh, an organization in Ohio, and they were using it to uh, help reduce some bacteria levels in a stream. And basically, um, you can kind of see the graphic on the left side of the screen. We, there's a special uh, medium. It kind of looks and feels like carpet insulation. And we cut it into strips um, into varying degrees. And then we nail it in to the creek bed and then tie it off. And then there's one extra piece that will go on top. And it's weighed down and tied down. And what is going to happen is that the water is going to flow through this filter. And as the water flows through the filter, the material in the filter is going to ideally reduce some of the bacteria levels that are in this creek. And so uh, we installed these and in about, I think it was April, and we partnered with a couple of faculty members from Santa Cruz Uni University who have um, the lab equipment for testing E. coli levels. And so we started testing the water quality of this site once a month, and we will pick up back again in the spring to monitor the trends and see if this filter is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Hey, Kathy, can you hear me now? Oh, yep, yeah. Amy's here. Anything to add, Amy? Wonderful. Hi, everybody. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that we also um, received grant funding for this project from Iowa American Water and uh, through River Action uh, from a grant from Teens for Tomorrow. Um, so that helped um, or will help reimburse the purchase of the filter material and help pay for some of the lab costs. So those are really great partnerships we've had with all three of those organizations. All right, thanks, Amy. Also in 2020, at the very beginning of the year, we were excited to have enough snapshot water quality materials to put 10 kits together. This is something that we had been trying to do for a long time before we were borrowing a lot of this water quality material from the Iowa DNR after their Iowa water program had discontinued. And this type of testing equipment has a lot of um, disposable strips and ampules that we use. And so after a while, we either run out of material or some of these materials have an expiration date and so they're no longer able to be used. So we're constantly having to find the funds to restock these kits so that we can continue our snapshots. So um, we had a lot of help this year in acquiring these 10 kits. And so we want to give a shout out to uh, the Scott County Conservation Board for getting us um, some of the materials for that as well as Hawk, which is a major manufacturer of a lot of the test strips that the volunteers use to measure pH, chloride, ammonia, nitrogen, and so on. And then also IO American Water, um, once again, uh, provided us with some funds to uh, get some more materials for these kits. So we were happy that we had enough to go around for uh, 2020, and we even have a little bit left over that can roll into 2021. This also helps us increase the number of snapshot sites that we test as well as the number of volunteers that we can have. We've also developed a new app um, for snapshot data entry. So for those of you who have volunteered before know that normally I give you a clipboard with uh, paper data sheets. And so for each site, you are writing down the values that you find after you perform the various tests. So new in 2021, we are excited to be moving the snapshots into the 21st century by providing an app. Each volunteer group is going to get a tablet with this app preloaded on it. And what's really nice about it is that it will have an, uh, a map on it. So volunteers will be able to more easily find the water quality sites. Also, there's going to be a lot of preloaded data. So you will no longer have to worry about entering the six digit site number when you, when you go to a site. Also the date and time should be time stamped already when you get there. And then each parameter that you see here on the screen um, will be a drop down menu. So instead of writing down the value, you can just uh, click on the menu and then select the value that matches up with the test that you did. And also what's really nice on the administration side is that on the right hand side there, that's what I will see in my command center back at headquarters as all the volunteers are doing their uh, water quality tests, those dots will pop up after they've been, they're done doing the test. So I can keep track of where volunteers are, which sites they've tested already, and then actually see the data they've entered in real time. So it will be a really nice feature for our 2021 snapshots, and it will also improve the accuracy of the data that we get. 
and um, also uh, help out the volunteers um, when they are out in the field. So outreach this year um, was a little different because of COVID, but we still managed to um, do a, a lot of outreach, especially uh, thanks to Zoom and Eastern Iowa Community Colleges for, uh, and for doing all the logistics for that. Um, we had uh, 218 people attend our forums as of October. Obviously, we'll add a few more today. Um, we had 80 volunteers for our snapshot. We also had a special stream bank restoration workshop in February before um, COVID restrictions were in place. And that was to teach people about different types of practices for stream bank restoration on their properties. We had 25 there. Also on November 5th, we had a grants program webinar in which different organizations around the county and the state uh, shared, shared what kinds of cost share and grant programs were available for those who want to do water quality improvement projects. Also, we did other outreach, including first green program with the Bettendorf Middle School. We did uh, an erosion program for the Boy Scouts for a merit badge presentation. We also uh, talked about partners at the Progressive Action for the Common Good Green Drinks presentation. We had a booth at Bald Eagle Days and at the Bettendorf School STEM Fair. And then we also did a presentation on those Robin Creek biofilters for ISWEP, which is the Iowa Stormwater Education Partnership. So out of those total, we had another couple of thousand people reach there. And then we also um, did, oh yeah, the bioreactor presentation. So uh, quite a few people uh, reached this year. We also did a lot more volunteer cleanup events this year, and we hope to continue and grow that this year. This is a great way to get volunteers engaged in their local watersheds by getting their feet wet, so to speak, and to pick up trash along their local waterways. It brings awareness to the fact that we need to keep our watersheds clean, and also it's a positive thing to uh, have all these volunteers feel good about their hard work. So once again, um, we make this all possible by members and funding partners. So if you are interested in supporting our mission, you can go to our website, partnersofscottcountywatersheds.org. And you, if you click the support us button, which is at the top right hand of the screen, you can see more details about membership and funding partnership benefits, as well as you can purchase um, a, a membership or partnership online. Also, you can reach out to me if you are interested in paying for that a different way. Members and funding partners uh, will receive a partner to Scott County Watersheds water bottle and a sticker as a thank you for their support. You will also get some other benefits as well, at, um, including recognition at some of our forums and our publications and at our events. So um, once again, we thank you all for um, supporting us in uh, volunteering and in uh, monetary donations. So our plans for 2021, I've talked a little bit about uh, some of it, but a couple things that are still in the works that you will hear more about next year. We are partnering with Living Lands and Waters to do a floating classroom event. So Living Lands and Waters already takes some school groups out and summer camp groups um, on their flat bottom boats to do some watershed education. And uh, we are going to work with them to teach students about water quality management. And so we're going to take some of those snapshot kits out and do simple water quality tests with them. We're also going to bring in some professionals from the Corps of Engineers to talk about uh, mussels and how they are an important filtrate, natural filter system in watersheds, as well as uh, floodplains and how that changes uh, the different types of plants that grow in a floodplain. Also, we're going to do part two of our stream bank restoration workshop that I mentioned earlier. This will do information on your property. So in partnership with the DNR, and we are going to host future volunteer cleanup events there. So stay tuned for that. Also, we um, are going to work on getting some more water and quality improvement locations that are already in existence or in the works on our website so that you can visit those and learn more about them, as well as expanding and further focusing water quality monitoring efforts. This usually depends on uh, the funding that we get as well as the volunteer support that we get for our snapshots. Um, once again, entering our water quality monitoring results on a digital platform, 
Um, we have developed one interpretive sign at Westlake Park. Um, they installed a, a few best management practices to, as part of their restoration, and they are going to um, have us design some more signs for them. Um, we're also going to work on more interpretive signs along the Duck Creek Parkway and um, some other places in the county and partner up with more communities for local cleanup efforts. Um, we would also love to improve small boat access to Duck Creek and um, we are going to uh, hopefully create a public program for that. So I believe that's all I have. Oh, save the date. So like I said, uh, next forum will not be until February. You can hear more about that later on our website and social media. And our snapshots tentatively are scheduled for Tuesday, May 4th, Saturday, July 17th, and Tuesday, October 5th. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen. And if anyone has questions, please type them in the chat and we will be happy to answer those for you. All right, do we have any questions that anyone wants to ask in the chat? I know that's a lot of information in a short amount of time. So if you have more questions later, feel free to reach out to us. I guess you're just that good, Cassie. <laughs> well, I have a lot of help. So I wanna thank everyone for uh, tuning in today to hear about our activities. And um, also thanks to Amy and Steve and uh, the ATEC uh, staff for helping us this year with our uh, Zoom forums. And uh, they will uh, will be doing this um, as long as COVID restrictions are still um, in place. Um, also, uh, I want to uh, add that what, if we have any extra stream cleanups, um, for next year, we will advertise those on the Extreme Cleanup website, so extremecleanup.org. Hey, Cassie, I do see a question about E. coli sampling. <clears throat> we do not, the only E. coli sampling that's being conducted is on the, the, uh, the Robin Creek uh, biofilters that, we're, that St. Ambrose is uh, actually conducting their own, but we don't do E. coli anymore. We, we uh, any fecal analysis that we do is the fecal DNA QPCR uh, through source molecular or on other uh, sources. But as far as E. coli, we, the state has stopped doing that, at least in our area, and we don't do it as well, unless specific. And we, we did, we had a program the last few years where we were doing some of that um, sort of source tracking um, or to identify if samples were human or canine. Uh, we did not participate with that level of testing this year due to funding. Um, uh, we had some funding through um, the Waste Commission to do some samples uh, like that in the county in the past couple years, and then the city of Davenport was funding the samples within the city limits, um, and those sources just weren't available this year. We're hoping to pick that up again um, as soon as we can, for sure, um, but the E. coli testing itself as Steve mentioned, just doesn't give us enough information other than, yes, there's some bacteria here, but it, it's almost at, at some point not worth um, paying for those lab tests because it doesn't really provide us with any direction um, unless we know it's from a raccoon or a bird or from a, a sanitary sewer, um, which is how that, um, that MST or Q PCR testing um, helps us a little bit better. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions. Uh, so once again, thank you so much for tuning in today. And on behalf of Amy and Steve, I just want to also say thank you to all the volunteers that have helped us out this year. Thank you to our board members who um, have supported us this year and everyone else who's interested in water quality. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.